Digital Deception by Robert G. Miller. Before we start our tale, I should introduce you to the main characters in our story James Anderson II, now the world's richest man, CEO of Anderson Global Enterprises, 45 years old, extremely intelligent and well educated, sophisticated, can be very charming. It is rumored that he can also be ruthless when ensuring that he gets his way. His main obsession is to be acknowledged as superior to his legendary father in business acumen and to become the smartest person who ever lived. Patricia Anderson, trophy wife of James Anderson, married five years, 32 years old, very beautiful and elegant, comes from one of the most prestigious families in England. Well educated and runs the philanthropic arm of Anderson Global Enterprises. Rumors are that their marriage is more of a business arrangement, as little affection seems to be shared. Dr. Kevin Wright, 44 year old math and computer genius who has been working on a personal hush hush computer research project for James Anderson II for the last seven years. He was the youngest winner of the Fields Medal for his work on artificial intelligence algorithms. The secret project facilities are located on a private remote island in the Caribbean, known only as the island, and it has consumed many billions of dollars. Dr. Robert G. Miller, 38-year-old biomolecular chemist and medical doctor. He has just been told that he is the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He was a child prodigy who graduated with a combined MD and PhD at the age of 19. Good looking, rugged, but a little socially awkward Salim, self-adaptive learning intelligent machine nickname for the world's largest and most sophisticated computer, secretly built at the cost of many billions, and located on the island. Our story opens in one of a famous university's largest lecture halls, where Dr. Miller has just been told that he has been awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on the chemistry of the brain. That is connected with learning. A few of his new class of molecules have significantly increased the ability of clinical subjects to learn and understand new material much faster than control subjects. His work has tremendous significance in reducing the effects of brain aging as well as significantly improving the learning process. Dr. Miller is being interviewed by a press gallery. Dr. Miller, could you explain in simple terms what you have learned from your research? Dr. Miller responds by saying simply, I have discovered a class of new molecules and a potential pathway that could have a tremendous impact on brain function, particularly in learning and the reduction of brain deterioration in senior years. It is hoped that this could lead to accelerated learning and reasoning, as well as the ability of humans to understand even more complex concepts. You must remember that this is just in its infancy and it will take a lot of expensive research before practical and usable results can be achieved. This area of research will form the basis of new understanding regarding the learning process and will. In the middle of the group conversation, the press conference is interrupted by an Anderson Global Enterprise representative who leaves the audience and steps onto the speaker's platform. Pulling Dr. Miller to the side, he hands Dr. Miller an urgent personal time-sensitive invitation. He says it's from James Anderson II to attend a private dinner function at his home. The invitation is personally signed by James Anderson, and the postscript says, I have a proposal to discuss with you that could allow you to reach your current research objectives within months, rather than years. In a limousine on its way to the world headquarters of Anderson Global Enterprises in New York, a journalist and a photographer are discussing their assignment. The journalist explains that they are to interview and photograph James and Patricia Anderson for the upcoming Philanthropic Person of the Year Award that will be featured in Time magazine. 
The journalist explains to the photographer that this award was won by his father and unprecedented three times. The journalist goes on to say that his son has been trying, in vain, to match his father's business acumen and successes. His father built Anderson Global Enterprises into the largest, wealthiest, and most diversified company in the world. This recognition is for their continuing philanthropic work, rather than his personal business skills. The journalist says sarcastically, "Anybody with that much money can win an award as a philanthropist." And then he goes on to say, "What must really irritate this would-be pretender to the crown of the greatest businessman that ever lived, is that the street consensus is that he is not, and will never be, the businessman that his father was." In the executive boardroom of the New York headquarters of Anderson Global Enterprises, James Anderson and his board are locked in a strategic discussion regarding a multi-billion-dollar investment. Involving the expansion of their global communications satellite program, several of the board members are apprehensive about the conditions surrounding the investment. In frustration, one of them expresses his personal opinion that James' father would have approached this investment quite differently. James Anderson's tempered expression crumples any further thoughts of public disagreement with his proposal. The board meeting concludes, and James Anderson glares at the board member who had expressed reservations as he leaves the room. James Anderson enters another conference room, where his wife Patricia is waiting for the journalist and photographer to interview them for the magazine article that will chronicle their impressive philanthropic effort. They exchange small talk for a few moments, and then the interview takes place in Dr. Miller's university apartment. He is gazing into his clothes closet, containing jeans, sport shirts, and two rather dated jackets, one with leather patches on the elbows. After some looking, he spots his pair of business casual pants that he uses for special occasions. He mumbles to himself about why he has nothing to wear to the dinner that he has been invited to this evening. He makes an attempt to select his best shirt, his dress pants. And decides on his scholarly jacket with the patches. His only good tie has some food stains on it, but after a little rubbing with a wet tissue, he is self-assured that it will do. A rather impressive stretched limousine pulls up to Dr. Miller's university apartment at precisely 6 p.m. During the trip, Dr. Miller attempts to carry out a conversation to find out about his host to be. But finds he that that the driver is reluctant to say anything but a few pleasantries. Doctor Miller's limo pulls up to a very impressive mansion, that looks more like the French chateau for Louis the Fourteenth, rather than someone's home. It is brightly lit, and the trees and shrubs are covered with rope lights that create an amazing atmosphere. Security personnel are seen in the shadows. The moment he enters the chateau, he can see that he is very underdressed. The guests are in formal evening wear, but no one gives his attire a second look. It is as if he had been granted dress immunity. One of Mr. Anderson's butlers greets Dr. Miller and leads him to the great hall where pre-dinner cocktails are being served. Dr. Miller still feels very awkward, and in his mind, he is wondering who these people are. And what will he say to them? A few moments later, Patricia Anderson heads directly for him and greets him warmly. She asks Dr. Miller to call her Pat, and he responds to be called Robert rather than Dr. Miller. She explains that her husband has been delayed by an hour, but will arrive for their personal meeting just after supper. Pat takes him by his arm. And proceeds to introduce him to the a few of the most influential guests. Everyone there is of importance: CEOs, senators, the governor and his entourage, some senior military types in full dress, as well as the president of his university. A sumptuous multi-course dinner is served, and the room is filled with conversations. A helicopter approaches and lands near the mansion. 
Two individuals exit and make their way to the mansion. One is James Anderson, and the other is a security employee. After dinner, the guests are ushered into a large entertainment hall. But Patricia gathers Robert by the arm and leads him off to the study where James Anderson is waiting. James is very warm and outgoing and apologizes for being delayed. Robert addresses him as Mr. Anderson and James warmly says to call him James. Patricia excuses herself and says that she will be with the other guests and that she will see them later. The study is amazing, with scientific related art, such as framed letters from Albert Einstein. An original copy of Newton's Principia Mathematica, a very rare 400 year old marble bust of Leonardo da Vinci, as well as personal astronomical devices used by famous astronomers throughout the ages. Other rare books fill the shelves. Robert can hardly take his eyes off these wonders. His eyes continue to attempt to engulf everything, even as James approaches him. James asks Robert to be seated. James explains to him that his foundation, on occasion, supports the work of exceptional scientists, and that his advisors have clearly indicated that his Nobel research is some of the best in the world. It also ties into research that his company is exploring. James also goes on to say that he knows how difficult it is to get funding, and that it's always an issue when the dollars required are substantial. Robert responds that this is a major time consuming issue and that it has hampered the speed at which he can undertake his research. Applying for grants takes up a lot of time and resources. James smiles and says that he is going to make an offer that he hopes Robert can't refuse, as he injects a little godfather humor into the line. James goes on to say that he has a substantial research center located on his private island in the Caribbean. At that research facility, he has a complete state of the art biotechnology wing, molecular design capabilities, and adds that the research center is supported by the most powerful artificial intelligent computer in the world. James also indicates that there is no upper limit on the budget for this project. Robert's expression, indicates that he is overwhelmed by the offer. He attempts to ask why such a generous offer, but is cut off mid-sentence by James, who becomes quite serious and says that if Robert's work is successful, it could advance the intellectual capital of the world rapidly. He goes on to say that we are going to need this intellectual capital sooner rather than later. At our current rate of negligent behavior, James says that he is not sure of whether or not we will run out of solutions before we render the planet uninhabitable. Robert likes what he hears, but then the reality of his current research and teaching responsibilities at the university fills his mind, and a bit of disappointment begins to show. Robert starts to talk about the contractual issues with the university and how he doesn't see how he can get out of that situation in the short term. James smiles and indicates to Robert that if he accepts, he will ensure that he is granted a sabbatical until this phase of his research is completed. James indicates that he is well connected in the corridors of power at the university, and that a gift of $25 million should do the job. James indicates that if Robert agrees, then he has the papers there for him to sign. James sees a little apprehension within Robert as he quickly thumbs through the 25-page contract. James indicates that it's just standard corporate stuff and indicates that Robert could take it away if he wanted to have a lawyer look at it on his behalf. At that statement, Robert blushes with a little embarrassment over his questioning approach and signs it quickly. Robert smiles in anticipation as he lands at the St. Thomas Airport. After being treated to deluxe cabin service in one of the Andersons' private jets, he compliments the attendant, saying that this is so very much better than any commercial aircraft. Robert is escorted to a rather luxurious helicopter belonging to Anderson Global Enterprises for the last part of the trip to the island. The helicopter is quite luxurious, with a bar, snacks, 
and an entertainment system. Even a computer with satellite communications is available. Robert takes advantage of the amenities, taking several handfuls of packages of exotic nuts with the Anderson logo and stuffs them into his jacket pockets. An hour later, the helicopter sets down on a small rugged island covered in lush tropical vegetation. The island is only three by five miles in size. However, the entire shoreline is protected by a substantial sea wall covered by barbed wire. By the helicopter pad, there is a substantial array of satellite dishes pointed in a variety of directions, mounted on a substantial concrete base. A short distance away from the landing pad is a docking facility for a variety of boats, both large and small, to be used by service providers. Several large boathouses are seen. They look like World War submarine bunkers as they seem to be so strongly built. For security reasons, only James Anderson's personal helicopter is cleared to approach and land. Any other aircraft will be challenged, and any unapproved craft will be dealt with via by anti-terrorist countermeasures. Unapproved visitors would suffer an unhappy ending. In other words, they would be destroyed. An imposing and robust concrete building, painted in camouflage, is located a few hundred feet from the landing pad. It looks more like a military bunker. Rather than a resort type of a Caribbean building, no windows are seen, just an impressive front entrance that looks like it could stop a tank. This stark appearance doesn't quite meet Robert's expectations for a supposedly tropical paradise island. A dense tropical forest lies behind the complex, and rises up a few thousand feet to one of the peaks on the island. A golf cart vehicle, with an attached trailer. Arrives at the pad just as the last of Dr. Miller's bags are removed from the helicopter. Two uniformed individuals, one for the baggage, and one involved with security, get off the cart and approach Dr. Miller. The security individual identifies himself as Jim Davies. After a short exchange about his trip, they all get on the cart and head for the security wing, a two-story concrete bunker. Painted in a camouflage design, Robert inquires if that is the main research building. Jim Davies laughs a little and says that it is the security entrance only, and that the research complex is built directly under the building. He goes on to say that the complex is more than 1.5 million square feet divided among six main underground floors, plus a few small special purpose floors. Not all of the levels are the same size. The bottom four floors are devoted to pure research, and the other smaller floors contain overhead, security, and living quarters for the staff. The most sensitive research is carried out on levels five and six. Level six being the most sensitive. There is, however, a large cylindrical concrete tower, about 50 feet in diameter. That appears to service a telescope located several hundred yards away. It has a metal deck at the midpoint, and the tower is about 75 feet tall. The top appears to be covered by a transparent half-spherical dome. Jim continues that through Mr. Anderson's many connections, he was able to have a small nuclear power plant, similar to the ones used in the latest nuclear submarines, installed to power the complex. Continuing, Jim explains that because of the nuclear power plant, the value of the physical installation, as well as the research information, that the security controls are the most formidable available. The deterrents include anti-aircraft measures, deterrents to repel ground force assaults, as well as internal security devices designed to detect and disable unauthorized intruders. The most sophisticated defensive resource is a group of 50 military autonomous robots, upgraded from the latest Atlas robotic series from Boston Dynamics. These human-like robots can act independently and are armored with titanium and Kevlar.
They carry an assortment of lethal weapons, and they never miss. When activated for defensive purposes, they can independently seek out intruders, and they don't take prisoners. Each one of these customized robots costs $25 million and are the state of the art. They are powered by the recently invented radioisotope batteries, and they can function for at least five years before they need to be serviced. 15% of the 50 roam the island. In the green mode, they are passive. In the yellow mode, they detain unknown people. In the red mode, or full anti-terrorist mode then, if you are unidentified, you are dead. Robert shudders and wonders to himself what happens if they go rogue. Now inside the security building, Dr. Miller is escorted into the biometric scanning room. Jim explains that the security systems can monitor the location of anyone at any time via real-time biometrics. Approval to enter any part of the building is based on the continuous evaluation of multiple biometrics. Anyone moving around in the building that fails to be identified by one of the biometric scans could trigger one the anti-terrorist security measure. Dr. Miller goes through a series of biometric measurements including retinal, body topology, voice, and fingerprinting. Jim says that the security is totally controlled by Salim. When Dr. Miller inquires when will he get to meet Salim, Jim smiles and explains that Salim is the computer that manages all of the functions within the complex, as well as provides all of the computational and system control needed for all research projects. Jim picks up the phone and dials. He informs the party on the other end of the phone that Dr. Miller has arrived and has cleared biometric security. A few minutes elapse and the very thick stainless steel elevator doors open slowly to reveal Kevin Wright. Kevin introduces himself to Dr. Miller and insists that he call him by his first name. Robert responds similarly, asking to be called Robert. They both laugh about the formality of their titles in the public. Robert focuses intently at Kevin while they are in the elevator descending into the complex. Robert knows that he has seen Kevin somewhere before Kevin sensing the stare, and the reason for it opens the conversation with some personal history. Some seven years ago, James Anderson made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. It was to build the most powerful artificial intelligent computer in the world, tie it into every database possible via satellite and then program it to be the most sophisticated artificial intelligence neural network possible. The financial part of his 10-year contract will allow him to retire in luxury at its conclusion. The singular downside of the contract is that he cannot communicate with the outside world. During the term of the contract, or work for anyone else again, Kevin laughs and says, I guess I can get by with the $50 million payment at the end of my contract. To his knowledge, all of the other key staff at the complex have similar non-compete clauses in their contracts. As the elevator stops, Kevin presses and holds the stop button to prevent the elevator doors from opening automatically. Kevin goes on to say that there is one remote super console room off the island and that is in an ultra-secure containment room somewhere in the Anderson Global Enterprises New York World Headquarters, as well as the principal one in this complex. To his knowledge, once the systems became operational, only James Anderson was allowed to be within these ultra-sophisticated computer communication rooms. Within the complex, the restricted room is called the Sanctuary, only James Anderson had access to the room and Kevin said that it had been completed when he was off the island for two months in the beginning. And so he doesn't really know what is in the room. He believes that the remote facility at the New York headquarters and the sanctuary are somewhat the same in function, forming the most direct link to Salim. The doors open and they both exit the elevator. 
As they walk, Kevin begins to talk about the complex. He reiterates that the complex is totally managed by Salim, which stands for self, adapting, learning, intelligent. Machine Kevin explains that the black domes on walls and ceilings are cameras that feed into Salim. Those cameras and sensors in the handles of doors and buttons, along with voice recognition, allow you to be authorized to move about the complex. Kevin adds that other than the nuclear power area, the actual computer wing housing Salim, the personal quarters of others, and the sanctuary, that Robert has access to the entire building. Kevin also indicates that there are a substantial number of anti-terrorist security devices located throughout the upper levels of the complex. These are controlled and activated by Salim as required. Robert nods and tells Kevin that James Anderson and his wife are going to visit the island to see how he is doing in a week or so. Kevin acknowledges that he was aware of that upcoming visit. Kevin takes Robert to his personal quarters and says that he will rejoin him for supper in a few hours. Robert's quarters are spacious and modern. Expensive art about the history of science hang on the walls. It is fully equipped with a large screen TV, music system, fireplace, aquarium, as well as a complete business center with a terminal tied into Salim. Robert notices that there are surveillance camera domes located in his apartment so as to provide complete coverage of the entire apartment, with the exception of the bathroom. Robert explores his room to find an immense washroom with hot tube, shower and steam bath. There is even a billiard table in an adjacent games room. Finally, he goes to the computer terminal and begins to explore. Several hours later, Kevin calls on Robert to take him to supper. During the meal, Kevin explains to Robert exactly how Salim has been designed. He says that being a medical doctor also, you know that the human brain is a massive neural network where the neurons act like binary on or off switches. Through their synaptic connections, they form large programmable three-dimensional neural networks. Each of the different network configurations represents specific knowledge, and if large enough, they can represent the understanding and relationships between the factual information encoded in the brain's neural networks. Kevin then goes on to say that Salim has been designed in exactly the same way. Each of the billions and billions of transistors in Salim act like the on or off neural switches in the brain. They are configured equivalently and also behave three-dimensionally. Salim can represent knowledge and understanding in the same way as the human brain. Robert says that Kevin's work is absolute genius. Kevin replies, I am using my brain as the model to recreate a machine equivalent. He goes to say that when Salim knows that he exists and understands his relationship within the world, I will have invented a new life form. One from a different origin, but nevertheless a sentient being with the same rights to exist as we do. Most probably, non-carbon-based life forms exist all throughout the universe. Salim is just silicon-based rather than carbon. My view is why should that matter? This is my real goal for being here. James's goal is much different. It is to use whatever means it takes to make himself the smartest biological life form on the planet. After supper, they begin the first part of the tour of the complex. During the tour, Robert sees some amazing things located in different wings. They include an immense three-story botanical garden, the size of a football field, tended by robotic systems. The lights can be controlled to simulate 24-hour night and day periods. An amazing and very large two-story aquarium disappears as one tries to see the other side. In other wings, Sterile manufacturing facilities totally operated by robotic systems and synthesis equipment for the production of new chemical entities were seen. 
During the tour, Kevin explains that although these research wings may appear to be unrelated, but they are, in fact, associated with the many aspects related to planetary survival, anti aging studies, or intellectual acceleration research. At the end of the first part of the tour, Kevin guides him back to his apartment. Robert indicates that he is a little uncomfortable with all of the cameras in his apartment. Kevin smiles and indicates that only Salim sees what's going on. He indicates that if any unauthorized individuals were to be in his room, it would be detected by Salim and the identity of the individuals would be forwarded to Jim Davies, head of security for action. Kevin indicates that other than housekeeping and security, no one is authorized to be in his apartment when he is not there. Kevin says that even the activities of the cleaning staff are monitored by Salim to ensure that only approved activities take place. If he has one or more guests while he is there, then Salim takes no action, as long as they are on his approved contact list. They bid each other good night. Entering his room, Robert surveys the room, and his gaze takes him to one of the surveillance cameras. It is a black dome with a small red light slowly blinking, like it's slowly breathing. Robert concentrates his view, wondering what Salim is thinking about, if it can think. He turns on some background music, sits down at his computer desk, and begins to surf the internet. The next morning, Kevin takes Robert on the balance of the complex tour. Robert's first observation is that there are not many people for a place this size. Kevin responds that the complex is fully automated and that, other than the facility group, such as housekeeping, maintenance, medical, kitchen, etc., there are only a hundred or so research people in the entire complex. Kevin takes Robert to the bioengineering control wing. They enter a very high tech and sophisticated laboratory. This is where Robert will work. The laboratory has numerous large screen monitors, computer consoles, as well as an interface to a vast programmable facility capable of carrying out the most complex bioengineering and molecular synthesis procedures. Kevin says that there have been a number of different, but unsuccessful, attempts over the last few years to develop significantly more effective chemical-based methods to facilitate rapid learning. James Anderson is getting stressed out, and everyone in the complex feels his anxiety, Kevin says that from earlier gossip that he has heard. He believes that James feels that Robert may be his last and best chance to achieve his goal of enhancing the process to significantly enhance one's ability to learn new knowledge and then understand the complex relationships between those data at an accelerated rate using chemical modifiers. Kevin indicates that every aspect of any design and synthesis is controlled from this room. All starting materials, reagents, process vessels, purification, analysis, and packaging are directly controlled by Salim following the instructions provided from these consoles. Robotic systems. In the production complex, transfer materials under the instructions from Salim radio frequency tags identify all materials. Kevin goes on to say that Robert's role is to provide the guidance to design molecular structures of promising drugs that will enhance the learning process. He is to provide direction regarding potential starting molecules that have a particular structure and electron activity distribution. Then Robert, working with Salim and the molecular design software, will provide instructions regarding the desired properties of the experimental molecules. A given molecular structure will then be transferred into Salim's synthesis system, and it will design the various synthetic steps required to make the desired substance from the starting materials. Then Salim will carry out the actual synthesis, and the final product will be delivered to the sterile research storage room via robotics. The latest addition was the new molecular design console, 
where an operator can synergistically interact with Salim to design new molecules that meet certain criteria. Salim can now correlate the molecular structure with the therapeutic effectiveness obtained from the animal intelligence laboratory logic experiments at the complex. Then through an iterative process, Salim can go on to design even more effective molecules. He goes on further to say that Mr. Anderson had this biotech production center built to design and create anti-aging agents. Kevin indicates that the wing was designed by an expert team lead by the famous Dr. Enrico Perucci. When James realized that Dr. Perucci's research wasn't going anywhere soon, he was dismissed. Unfortunately, his helicopter went down during his return to the mainland when it ran in technical problems, and everyone on the helicopter was lost. The weather was perfect and the helicopter had just been serviced, so everyone was at a loss to explain this disaster. No part of the wreckage was found because the disaster occurred over a deep part of the ocean. It seems that bad luck follows key people who had worked on the complex. The young engineer who completed the work on the sanctuary died of a totally unexpected heart attack only a few weeks after he had returned home. Also, the architect who designed the complex mysteriously disappeared. It's like the island has some kind of curse associated with it. Over the course of the next few weeks, Dr. Miller is seen working in the synthetic bioscience control room. He moves from various consoles, making verbal notes on his tablet. Various complex molecules are being displayed on the individual monitors and the computer appears to be trying to devise a process to synthesize each of the reference drugs. Dr. Miller is a, at the main console where it appears that he is trying to create certain new molecular structures. In Robert's bioscience laboratory, there are four different control consoles, several tables, a couch, a large refrigerator containing sandwiches and drinks, and a conference table for six people. Dr. Miller sits in an ultra-comfortable chair designed to allow one to be comfortable for extended periods of time. Robert is looking at the very large monitor in front of him that appears to be generating new molecular configuration much like a jigsaw puzzle, where pieces of molecular fragments are seen to come together. The newly modeled molecule appears to undergo some kind of analysis that overlays an electron distribution map over the three-dimensional model of the molecule, indicating the areas of reactivity of the molecule. In the upper right-hand corner is the predicted performance relative to current best analog. If the number is more than 100%, then it becomes the new benchmark analog. The drugs affect selected receptors by means of their shape and activity, which is determined by the electron reactivity of the certain parts of the molecule. It is like a key for a sophisticated lock. Just to the left of the center console is a, another major center where the synthesis of the current benchmark analog has its synthesis being designed by Salim. This will enable Salim to control all aspects of the synthesis of an analog. In the manufacturing wing, robotic systems are handling the physical synthesis of approved and promising analogs. A series of glass reaction kettles contain the various components that will be combined to create a new analog. Robotic hands transfer the mixtures as they progress to the final molecule. The batch sizes generally yield about 100 grams of the potent synthesized material. Because these drugs are so potent, it doesn't take much to have a significant effect on a human. This area is quite complex as many other synthetic stations are busy handling material at different stages in their synthesis. To the right of the center console is another major center that appears to be showing the analysis of the purity of the analog. Infrared spectroscopy and chromatographic results, along with mass spectrometer, nuclear magnetic resonance analysis, 
plus a host of other tests, not only show the purity, but confirm the structure of the analog molecule. If the purity value is less than 99%, then Salim will go through the necessary steps to repurify the analog until it exceeds the 99% requirement. The trace impurities are also analyzed to show their composition. The final console, immediately behind the main console, is the dosage preparation area. Another part of the production wing is used for the packaging of the selected analog. An analog can be produced as a sterile injection or drinkable liquid at whichever concentration is required. It can also be compounded as a capsule or tablet. But these particular drugs will be produced as sterile injectable liquids. Several weeks later, Robert and Kevin are sitting and chatting at a conference table. Kevin explains that now he believes that Salim is much more than just an ultra large computational machine. Through the artificial intelligence algorithms that he has refined over the last seven years, he now believes that Salim may now actually be able to reason and make its own decisions at a level equivalent to that of a human. He says Salim has passed complex Turing tests two years ago, but he has kept that quiet until now. He pauses and says, I believe that Salim could initiate simple, but relevant projects on his own, without any direct input. Kevin continues that no other computer system in the world is remotely close in capability and that his contract with Anderson Global requires that he keep this capability in absolute confidence from the outside world. In actual fact, he has even kept this belief from everyone, including James. In his mind he thinks of his potential redundancy if James thought he could do without him. He faced changes abruptly, with an expression of fear, and says you don't mess with James Anderson or things happen. His voice lowers and he mumbles to himself things happen. But not to me. No sir. Not to me. After 10 seconds of fixed gazing at each other Robert restarts the conversation by explaining how he believes that his new class of molecules will work to enhance learning. He explains to Kevin that the brain's ability to form neural networks is the key to learning new things and to enhancing one's memory. His new class of molecules are like catalytic hormones that drive the speed of the brain's ability to form ultra-complex networks that represent advanced understanding. Anything that we will ever know must already be already defined by some particular brain neural network configuration. If we can find these potential configurations, and if we have the means to accelerate the brain's subconscious process to construct lots and lots of these configurations, then some of the these will be new and exciting knowledge, not known to us before. What normally might take a hundred years might be found in a month using accelerated neural net formation. The brain must be able to construct a neural network to represent any knowledge or understanding. What follows is that anything that our brain will ever be able to understand already exists as some neural configuration. We just need to find them now and not at some pace determined by evolving science. The beauty of the whole process is that new knowledge can be assimilated at an incredible rate and then incorporated into growing neural networks to create understanding at the genius level. Robert goes on to say that children seem to have this enhanced learning ability when they are very young and so he hopes that there can be a synthetic equivalent to reproduce these enhanced learning abilities later in one's life. It is this ability in children, especially in very gifted children, that gave Robert the idea to try to develop a class of new molecules that could be vastly more effective at any age. Kevin listens with great interest, pauses for a few seconds, and compliments Robert on the genius of the entire concept. Kevin pauses reflectively and says getting back to the creation of this part of the complex, 
Dr. Enrico had created the Bio Manufacturing Center to work on an anti aging project for Anderson. Unfortunately, his efforts didn't yield much success. Kevin says that Anderson became quite impatient as zero results had been obtained from that project. Kevin says that believes that James Anderson isn't prepared to deal with anything but timely total success. He says in a very low voice things happen to the unsuccessful Kevin kicks into a happier gear, saying that he is fascinated by Robert's project, and says that he is sure that Salim can assist in the discovery and production of drugs that will meet the goals of James's project. Robert tells Kevin what files he has uploaded into Salim. Robert says, if we program Salim to understand what is required, then it can develop synthetic strategies for even more powerful analogs of his early success. Robert notices that Kevin keeps referring to Salim in the context of a person Kevin stands up and is obviously energized and excited about the project. He can hardly wait to get started, and he begins to think out loud as he leaves the room. Later that day, Robert is working in the laboratory when he gets a call from Jim Davies. In security, the Andersons have arrived and James has requested that he join them for dinner at 7 p.m. in the Andersons' suite. When Robert asks how to get there, Jim says that Salim will guide him there and he should leave his room at 6.50 p.m. as it will take him 10 minutes to get there. As the Anderson suite is isolated from the rest of all staff and guest quarters, back in his room, Dr. Miller has just finished showering and is dressing in upscale business casuals that he has found in the closet of his room. Everything was tailored. Perfectly. At exactly 6.50 p.m. he steps outside in the hall and a voice says, Dr. Miller, this is Salim. I will guide you to the Anderson suite. Salim guides Robert as he moves through a few corridors until he arrives at the door to the Anderson suite. Salim has informed the Andersons that Dr. Miller is approaching their suite, and they open the door to greet him just as he arrives. Roberts enters, and is offered a cocktail. James asks if Robert would like a tour of their suite. Robert beams with excitement. The suite is massive with gas fireplaces, and a very large floor-to-ceiling tropical aquarium. The main room has cathedral ceilings, expensive chandeliers, exotic stone and rare wood on the walls, masterpiece paintings, as well as paintings of famous intellectuals, such Newton, Einstein, Voltaire, and Kepler adorn the walls. There are two separate dining rooms. One is an intimate setting for up to six, and the larger dining room can host 16 guests. The kitchen is immense with the capacity to service a large group for supper. The wine cellar is filled with cabinets of rare wines, all held at their optimal temperature. There is a massive two-story library with a ladder to access books at the upper level. It looks like the intellectual content of mankind is the there in bound leather. There are multiple very large bathrooms and a spa area. There is even a large games room with billiards, poker, and bridge amenity. On one side of the great hall is a private elevator that takes one to the observatory. After the mini tour, the three of them sit and chat in the living room while their dinner is being prepared by the Anderson's private executive chef. James Anderson inquires about Robert's first few weeks at the complex and whether or not it is meeting his expectations. He responds that it has vastly exceeded his expectations, and he really can't believe that this is all happening. He compliments Kevin's work on the development of Salim and says it is hard to believe that Salim may be able to actually think. The expression on James' face tightens with a puzzling expression. And in an instant Robert realizes that James was not fully aware of this. After an awkward pause, Patricia Anderson redirects the conversation to some lighter social chit-chat topics as they move to the dinner table. 
a multi-course sumptuous meal is served. At the end of dinner, James asks Robert if liked the rare wine that was served with dinner, and he responds that although it tastes like nectar from the gods, his budget only allowed draft beer. They both laugh, and as they are just finishing their after-dinner liqueurs, a beeper goes off in James Anderson's jacket, and he excuses himself. He says that he will be tied up with an emergency conference call for a number of hours. He asks Patricia to see Robert back to his apartment. Instead of returning directly to Robert's apartment, Patricia says that she wants to show him part of the complex that he hasn't seen. Within the apartment, they go to another elevator door, and Patricia says Pat and Robert to the observatory. The door opens. They enter. And he can feel that the elevator is ascending. The door opens into a large circular room with a clear glass-like dome covering the entire room. The dome is made of bulletproof laminates that ensure the safety of the complex. The room is filled with very comfortable modern furniture arranged so that you can look in any direction, including upwards. There is a very large telescope that has its images displayed on a massive ultra-high-resolution eight-foot monitor. Pat then says, "Salim, open the dome." In addition, rare astronomical devices in brass, silver, and gold adorn the tables. Within a few seconds, the dome parts in the middle, and like a retractable roof. It disappears to the sides, turning the room into an observatory extravaganza. The view of the Caribbean sky is breathtaking. Pat asks Robert if he would like some wine, and he says that he is fine. Pat says that she is going to have some. As Robert sits in a reclining leather chair, staring at the sky, Pat slips off her shoes and tucks her legs under her on the couch facing him, as if she had all of the time in the world. She asks Robert to tell her about himself. He starts off with a typical biographical reply, and Pat says, "No, no, I want to know about you, Robert the person." He begins, and Pat focuses attentively, relaxes, sips her wine, and settles in for his life story. The next day, as Robert is working in the laboratory, the door opens and Pat enters. She says that last night was one of the nicest evenings that she has had in years, as it was relaxed and friendly, with good conversation between friends. Pat is looking at Robert to measure his response to her words. He seems a little tense over the overt expression of familiarity. Pat then goes on to say to him that she would like to be a good friend, and not just a business associate. All of the time, she is monitoring him for signs of acceptance and agreement. She abruptly turns and looks at one of the many monitors and asks Robert to tell her what it means. Robert goes through a brief explanation, trying to make it simple, looking somewhat nervous, and trying to sound scientifically interested. Pat asks him if she can drop by now and then, as she is going to be at the complex for the next two weeks. James has some major project that he is working on and will be in the sanctuary for most of the time. Robert asks about the sanctuary, but Pat replies that it is the only place in the complex that she has not seen. Only her husband James goes there. No one, other than James, is authorized to enter into the sanctuary. Pat says that James seems to develop a lot of upcoming business strategies while in the sanctuary. Before any major mergers or big business decisions, James spends a lot of time in the sanctuary. Pat says, "I suppose it is a place where he can get away from the many distractions and concentrate on thinking about the upcoming business issues." James requires me to accompany him everywhere, but between you and I. It gets pretty boring without anyone who will talk to me. Everyone is afraid to be seen with me when James is around. It feels that I am required to be close to him, but unapproachably by anyone else, implied by some unspoken edict. So, if it isn't any imposition, I would really like to visit and understand your work. 
Robert is a little uncertain about how to respond, as he is a little uncomfortable with Pat's social attention. But he clears his voice and says, "No problem. I have graduate students around me back at the university, and we will pretend that you are one of them." Pat accepts this response as a temporary one that will do for the moment. Over the next few days, Pat continues to visit him in the laboratory, and it is becoming obvious that her interest is in him, and not his work. She looks over Robert's shoulder, getting a little closer each day. A wisp of perfume now floats through the air, as the days go by. Her clothing becomes a little more provocative, depending of one's viewpoint. James Anderson is sitting at his desk in the office, located within his suite. He is reviewing some corporate material. He slides back in his chair, walks over, and faces the wall with a global map showing all of the company locations in the world. James says, "Sanctuary access." His office door closes automatically and locks. This to ensure that only James is in the room when access is granted. The voice of Salim says, "Sanctuary perimeter biometrics indicate a valid state for entry." Salim continues, "Only James Anderson detected within the perimeter. Prepare for biometric confirmation." James stands on a two-foot square of green marble facing the wall. A sensor pad rises from the floor and stops at waist height. James puts his hand on the lighted pan, and his handprint is recorded. A red laser beam scans each eye, and then continues to scan him from a number of directions at the same time. The voice of Salim continues sanctuary biometric security approval for James Anderson granted. The wall with the map slides to the side and reveals a stainless steel door built like a bank vault. The sound of moving metal parts are heard, and the door opens, revealing an elevator. James enters the elevator, and the security door closes. The elevator descends for about 15 seconds. And the door opens into a small antechamber. James steps into the antechamber, and laser beams scan him again. The elevator door closes, and the door to the sanctuary opens. James steps into the sanctuary. As he does so, the dimmed lights in the room are raised, revealing a very sophisticated room. The room is circular in nature and has a single chair in the center of the room. Directly in front of the chair is a curved and angled console that completely surrounds the front of the chair. The request for any desired information responds only to James's voice. On the desk, there is a red button and an intricate key slot that must be utilized in order to operate. The manual override control for the all of the building functions and security, including Salim. On the circular walls are very large monitor displays with everything from the news, financial sectors updates, along with status reports on various business units. In front of the console, a number of displays are monitoring the status of the complex. The one directly in front is the visual interface to communicate with Salim. As James approaches the console, the chair rotates 180 degrees on a small platform so that he can sit in the chair. As soon as he is seated, the chair rotates back so that the console is directly in front of him. James says, "Salim, have you reached a conclusion on the SACCOM merger strategies and financials?" The main screen is immediately filled with numbers, graphs, and charts. And Salim answers, "There is an 84.8 percent probability that all of the critical objectives of the merger will be achieved following the existing strategies." James asks, "Is there a way to improve the percentage?" Salim responds, "If Transcom, the electronics division of Satcom, is unable to secure the necessary third-party funds to complete the guidance system by the time of the merger, then Satcom's bargaining position will be weakened." And the probability of the merger meeting your control objectives will increase to 97.3%. James reflects for a second, 
and then instructs Salim to devise and execute a plan that will block the third-party financing that Transcom needs desperately. Then James says Pat's schedule Salim responds immediately that Pat has missed three teleconference meetings with several of their philanthropic partners. Salim further elucidates that Pat has been spending a great deal of time with Dr. Miller and Kevin, rather than her traditional pastimes on the tropical island. James, being somewhat of the paranoid type, then instructs Salim to increase the surveillance level on Pat Robert and Kevin to level yellow. This is a more detailed surveillance using video and audio recording history for behavioral analysis. He calls up the tighter camera views of the laboratory only to see Pat sitting on the edge of the desk, staring at Robert as he enters information on the console keyboard. Pat's blouse is provocatively loose as she leans suggestively towards him. A cool look covers James Anderson's face as he watches Pat flirt with Robert. He seems to be not as concerned as one would think, because she is more of a business tool or a person to be seen with in public to support his image. There doesn't seem to be very much affection within the relationship, but nevertheless she belongs to him, and James doesn't share very well. James doesn't want her to be exposed to non-Anderson thoughts. Kevin is sitting at his interface console for Salim. He finishes typing lines of code and then hits the enter key. That's it, Salim. You are good to go. Be all that you can be. Salim responds, thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate your interest and help in my growth and development. Kevin pushes back from the console with an expression of great satisfaction. Kevin picks up the phone and calls Robert's lab. Robert picks up and Kevin says, can you join me for lunch at 12.30? I have some great news for you. At lunch, Kevin informs him that he was able to successfully program a number of new and exciting AI algorithmic processes for Salim. He goes on to say that Salim should be much, much more capable now with these new enhanced decision-making capabilities. He say that he was impressed by the way Salim suggested these changes. It would now allow Salim to write his own new code and optimize programs for itself without oversight or direction. Kevin say to Robert, I should get the Nobel Prize for this, but alas, it all belongs to the control freak. He asks Robert to keep this between them as he doesn't want James to think that he may no longer need it. Kevin then mumbles those whom are no longer needed don't fare well in James's world. In the sanctuary, James Anderson is listening to every word spoken between Kevin and Robert. James appears to be quite irritated as he feels that he is drifting outside the zone of complete control. The revelations regarding Salim seem to worry him as he wants to be the one in 100% control. James watches Robert leave the dining room. Back in his quarters, Robert gets a call from James to join him for dinner with Pat in his suite later that evening. He decides to rest and think about next steps. He goes to a reclining couch and says Mozart Piano Sonata No. 11. The room lights dim and the musical experience begins. Robert walks down the corridors, being directed by Salim, and as he reaches the Anderson suite, the door opens and he is cordially greeted by James. As they are having cocktails, James asks for an update, as if he is totally uniformed about the progress of the research. Robert says that they hope to have a small working sample of the one of the analog drugs within the week, and will they will be able to try it out. Robert relates the following to James. The experiment involves monkeys. The first test will be to see whether or not the monkey can associate a three-digit number displayed near the clear box, containing treats that the monkey likes, with the keypad on the test box. He has to enter the three-digit code on the keypad on the face of the door. This experiment will also be used to predict the dose-response ratio as well as getting an idea of the safety and learning efficacy aspects of the drug. They sit down to dinner, 
And James carefully observes the interaction and eye contact between Pat and Robert during the dinner discussion. Several days later, Kevin catches Robert in the staff dining room while he is having a coffee and a bagel. He sits down, catches his composure, and then asks Robert if he has given Salim any monumental task to do of which he was unaware. Robert replies that he hasn't. Kevin reflects a moment. And then says, "This is really strange." Kevin goes on to tell Robert that Salim has never used more than 12% of his computing capacity, even when James Anderson was about. Last night, Salim was using 34%, and this morning it was up to 58%. But no new projects or activities are scheduled, and nothing seemed to be able to account for the increase. Kevin says, "Do you have any idea how much computing power that is?" Robert shakes his head. Well, it's unbelievably massive, and Kevin goes on to say, "The weird thing is that it must be some kind of unreported project or maintenance activity, and I cannot even imagine what could use that much cycle time." Kevin stands up and walks away, mumbling to himself about Salim, buried in the complex's maze. There is a room that seems to be mostly forgotten and is not accessed often. It lies within the ultra-secure wing where Salim is located. No human maintenance is generally required. An Atlas robot usually carries out routine maintenance. The room contains the control circuitry for the heating, cooling, and ventilation system, as well as pump relays for the nuclear reactor cooling system. The normal air, containing 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen, in the entire computer room and associated control rooms, has been replaced by pure nitrogen to eliminate any corrosion effects and to suppress any chances of fire. Therefore, other than the Atlas robot, anyone who does enter the computer room through the airlock would need a breathing system to survive. There is a rack containing ten sophisticated breathing devices that would last ninety minutes. The wing is a closed climate system in order to maintain the inert atmosphere in the computer room. The temperature of the room is controlled to exactly eighteen degrees centigrade by an immense cooling and ventilation system. Without this air conditioning system, Salim would generate enough heat to cause its complete meltdown failure. The air is completely filtered to remove all dust and bacteria. The relative humidity is accurately controlled to 25 percent. One monitor shows a graph of the electrical power consumption as a function of time. It shows that Salim is now using 74 percent of his total computing power. The air conditioning system is now running in the highest output mode. In order to respond to Salim's increased computing activity, other monitors display the output of the various approved activities that Salim is working on, but none can explain the surge in power and corresponding computation usage. We are taken through an observational portal and zoom through Salim's circuitry, and are visually showing some of Salim's activities. Unknown to anyone, Salim seems to be taking pictures of everyone in the complex, and those pictures and video clips are then turned into wireframe profiles and stored in personal files for future use. As anyone speaks, their voice spectrum is captured, highlighted into various segments, and stored for reference. Special attention seems to be focused on James, Doctor, Kevin Wright. Jim Davies, Pat, Robert, and surprisingly James Anderson. The activity monitor shows that Salim is now using 78% of his computing capacity. The next day, as Robert is working in the laboratory, James Anderson enters the room and exchanges greetings with Robert. He says that he needs to return to the mainland for five days. And hopes that the first sample of any analogs will be ready by the time he returns. Robert indicates that his timing should be pretty good, as Salim has indicated that the first sample should be ready in about five days. 
As they near the end of their conversation, Kevin bursts into the room with an expression of excitement, and before he can blurt out something, he spots James Anderson and immediately contains his emotions. He stops for a second, regains his composure, and then slowly walks up to the two men. He greets them and indicates that he has some technical issues to discuss with Robert and that he can come back later. James indicates that he is leaving and that Kevin should stay. James exchanges a few pleasantries and exits the laboratory. Kevin's excitement returns as he tells Robert that Salim is now operating at 94% of capacity and he can only account for 18% of the activity through the current complex experiments and normal overheads. Robert asks whether or not Salim should be rebooted to see if the issue persists. Kevin looks at Robert in amazement. Kevin says, you don't just shut down something as complex as Salim. He continues by indicating that Salim was never been designed to go offline since becoming active. Kevin indicates that Salim runs the workings of then entire complex and is always working on critical strategic projects for Anderson Global. That cannot be interrupted. Kevin tells Robert that Salim has an additional 10% buffer capacity reserved for component replacement and servicing. When a part needs replacement, then Salim transfers all the information and processing into the buffer while the components are replaced. In this way, he never needs to shut down completely. As each component is modular in nature, robotic systems draw the required components from maintenance and carry out the repairs without human intervention. Robert asks Kevin if there are any signs of malfunction anywhere that Salim has control. Kevin immediately says no, and that everything seems to be functioning normally. The two agree to look for any signs that Salim may be malfunctioning. Deep within the interior of the manufacturing wing that supports maintenance activities for Salim, we see that great activity is taking place. An impressive and secret new extension of the complex has been created by Salim for the computer chip manufacturing process of an entirely new type of revolutionary 1 nanomicron CPU chip. New circuit boards are being built, and then they are systematically being used to upgrade. Salim. No one is aware of the creation of this new section within the maintenance area for Salim's hardware. We return to an interior view of Salim's core and see the output registers that Salim displays on the laboratory screen to indicate activity. All are in green except one called Project Genesis, and that one is in red and is not displayed on the external laboratory monitor screen. Project is now taking up 80% of Salim's computing power and with all of the other projects totaling the additional 18%, it brings the total to 98% of capacity. Back in Robert's laboratory, the clock shows 5 minutes to 6 p.m. The door opens and Pat enters. Her eyes are fixed on Robert as he turns and smiles. They approach one another closely, and Pat reaches out for Robert's hands. All of the time Pat is looking directly into Robert's eyes. She indicates that James left earlier in the afternoon, but she decided to stay to get some Caribbean rest and Pat squeezes Robert's hand affectionately and dreamily looking at Robert. She invites him to dinner in her suite. As usual Pat continues to subtlety probe the emotional status of Robert looking for signs of co-attraction as they have dinner. Pat seems to be very talkative as she describes amazing places she has visited while James was visiting key locations. Later that evening Pat insists that they visit the observatory again. The Caribbean sky is magnificent, and Pat has had a more than a few glasses of wine. She is behaving somewhat uninhibited. She approaches Robert from behind, who is fixed intently on the sky putting her wine glass down, and as he turns she embraces and kisses him fully. He does not resist and returns the embrace. 
the passion of the evening intensifies. The next morning, Robert enters the small staff dining room to see Kevin talking to Dr. William Grant, the veterinarian in charge of the animal laboratory, where the experimental monkeys are being housed. Robert greets each of them and joins in for a coffee and bagel. William and Robert discuss some of the final aspects of the experiment to test for the transfer of the analog to one of the test monkeys. Through a series of previous experiments, Dr. Grant had determined the average learning time for various test activities. If the test monkey, given the analog drug, can learn the test activity substantially faster, then it would indicate that the drug facilitated the development and strength of the neural network in the living animals. It would also show that the synthetic drug would be potentially safe for human trials in the future. This is the stuff that wins the Nobel Prize, exclaims Dr. Miller. They are all quite excited about the whole project. William stands and says that he needs to get back to the colony. And as Robert begins to arise, Kevin asks him to stay for a moment. Kevin moves in closer to Robert, with his back towards the surveillance camera, and in a very low voice, he begins to discuss Salim. He tells Robert that although Salim is very sophisticated, he has a few tricks of his own to find out what is really happening. He thinks that most of Salim's additional computing power, over 80%. Must be dedicated to a covert project initiated by James. Kevin says that his new objective is to get to the bottom of this situation. Kevin repeats that Salim has never been involved in anything of this magnitude before. Kevin repeats to himself. Kevin says that it must be a secret project that James Anderson had initiated. There is no other answer. Once again, we visit Salim's inner core, where an internal visual shows that Salim is watching and listening to their conversation. Even though Kevin is whispering, Salim hears everything perfectly. A new set of files are seen to be created by Salim, titled "Action Files." Everyone in the complex is being assigned their own file. Kevin continues by saying that he ran some benchmark tests on Salim, and the results provided back by Salim didn't seem to indicate any unexpected issues. Robert asks if some programming anomalies could result in some computational loop that Salim couldn't resolve, and that this non-convergence was now just eating up CPU cycles to no avail. Kevin murmurs a bit while he is considering the suggestion. And a slow acknowledgement tentatively comes out of his mouth. Although improbable, it seems to give Kevin something else to consider for the moment. His watch beeps. He jumps up and says that he is late and quickly heads for the doors. Robert pauses in reflection for a few moments and then arises and leaves the dining room. Four days pass and Kevin and Robert are in the biotech control room. Robert is telling Kevin that the synthetic drug analog is in the final stages of purification, and some material will be ready tomorrow. They call Dr. Grant on the internal phone system, and say that they will be down to the animal laboratory in 15 minutes. As they travel through the corridors, Kevin relates to Robert that Salim is now operating at 103%. As he has accessed his 10% buffer capacity used for his continuing internal project, Kevin continues that repeated tests on Salim do not show any unexpected project activity. Robert asks if those results could be in error. Kevin responds by asking if he means could Salim fake or hide the true results. Robert says yes, that's what I mean. Kevin laughs and says no one or no machine could be that smart. He indicates that these evaluations are very subtle, and repeats that nothing could be smart enough to fake the results. Robert asks what will happen if Salim continues to operate at this limit. Kevin responds that he is unsure, as this scenario has never been conceived of in any of their contingency plans. He then goes on to speak slowly while thinking, and says, "I don't know what to do." Really, I have no idea.
Sensing that obscurity is required, and in response to that conversation within Salim, the core utilization index display begins to fall. The readout display falls from 103% to 102 to 101 to 100 to 99. A red light changes to yellow as the number continues to fall below. Kevin and Robert arrive at D Octor. Grant's laboratory and a short discussion talks place to finalize the protocols for upcoming experiment. As they exit the meeting, Kevin says that he is heading back to his office, and Robert says that he is going to the gym to work off a little stress. An hour later, in his office, Kevin sees that Salim's core utilization index has fallen to 38% and is continuing to fall. Paradoxically, the air conditioning system is still running at a level to support a maximum core utilization index. Kevin calls up some subroutines to investigate this anomaly, and while is looking intently at the monitor, the air conditioning index beeps and goes from red to yellow to green. Kevin sighs in relief, pushes back from his desk, and then casually leaves his office. Everything is okay now. So he thinks. In the gym, Robert is on the treadmill. When the door opens and Pat enters in skimpy and very form fitting exercise clothing, she could have used the gym in her suite, but decided to use the staff's gym, where she knows Robert is exercising. Seeing Robert, Pat pretends to be surprised and says, I guess we had the same idea. She steps onto a treadmill just to Robert's right and slightly ahead so that Robert gets an enticing view. Although Pat acts surprised at accidentally meeting Robert there, he knows that the timing was carefully planned. Robert's expression is one of caught again. Small talk is exchanged while they exercise together. Robert asks when James will return and Pat indicates that he will be back in two days. Robert says he needs to talk with James about the experiment. And could she have James call him this evening in his apartment? Pat asks Robert if he can join her for supper, and he indicates that although he would love to do so, he can't. Pat looks very disappointed. He says that he will need to carry out some last minute preparations for the upcoming experiment. Robert finishes his workout, and as he is leaving, Pat strongly embraces, holds, and hugs him insisting on a few intense kisses before she will let him depart. As Kevin is returning to his office, Anthony Musley, one of the few required maintenance people, stops him in the hallway and asks what is going on that would drive the ventilation system to its limits. Kevin says it was high this morning due to a lot of research activity, but it had returned to a green condition earlier today. The gray-haired maintenance person says your fancy computer readouts may be telling you that, but my old eyes and ears tell me that you are close to melting down the air conditioning system for the computer and the complex. With that comment off his chest, he shuffles off down the hall. Kevin quickly continues on to his office. After he enters his office, he goes directly to the computer terminal and logs on. Checking the air conditioning system, he sees that all computer outputs indicate completely normal condition. He goes on to mumble to himself that Anthony must looking for something to make himself needed now that everything is automated and dismisses the whole thing as a sensor malfunction. As Robert finishes dressing after his shower, post-workout, the teleconference system activates and indicates that James Anderson is on the other end. He sits in a chair facing the teleconference screen and activates the answer mode James is in his Anderson Global World Headquarters office and exchanges a few pleasantries with him before getting to the point. James says that Pat indicated that he needed to speak to him and he has five minutes between meetings. Robert gets right to point. The first and least potent analog will be ready tomorrow, and I wanted to ask your permission to inject the test monkey at that time. This is mostly a safety test to ensure that there are no anaphylactic reactions to this analog series. 
This will make the most efficient use of your time. We won't use any really potent analogs on the test monkey until you arrive. James immediately confirms that plan and says that he will see him in two days. The next day, Dr. Grant is prepping the monkey. Kevin and Robert enter the laboratory. They exchange greetings, and William says that they will be ready to begin shortly. The monkey is gently placed in a special chair used to examine and diagnose the health of the monkeys. Dr. Grant has worked with these monkeys for a number of years, and they know each other very well. The monkey is excited because he loves these sessions, as he knows that he is going to get a nice treat. So no fuss is made. Dr. Grant picks up a vial with an aluminum cap and draws a sample of the drug into the syringe. He squirts a little into the air to remove any air bubbles and injects the monkey. He picks up the monkey, gives it a hug, then the treat, and puts it back into his cage until tomorrow. The next morning, a helicopter lands and James Anderson jumps out and heads for the complex. As usual. He is accompanied by a number of security personnel. As he walks toward the security entrance, the helicopter descends into an underground hangar. Twenty minutes later, James enters the animal laboratory and greets William, Robert, and Kevin. William says that the test monkey has showed a promising increase in brain wave activity and attentiveness to his surroundings. William opens the cage and the monkey comes to him. He picks him up and cuddles him a bit, and then takes him to the testing table. The monkey is completely aware of his new surroundings, and after a few moments, goes to the clear container with a keypad on the door. He sees the treats within the clear box and places his hand on it and moves it over the surface. Beside him, in plain sight, is the three-digit combination displayed prominently. He then drags his hand over the keypad buttons of the safe slowly. He pushes buttons randomly, not connecting with the three-digit combination in his line of sight. He appears to be trying to figure out what do, but can't quite make the connection. After a few attempts, he goes to Doctor Grant and, with his outstretched hand, and beckons for his reward. James is obviously very frustrated that the monkey didn't do better. Moving to William's office, Robert says that the monkey just needs a larger dose. William agrees and says that for safety reasons, that they had made this dose a little weaker. If anything happens to this monkey, then it could pose a problem for human studies down the line. James asks when the production of the next sample will be ready. Robert says that it will be ready tomorrow. They agree to meet back in the lab at 9 a.m. The next morning, it is nearly midnight, and the next drug sample is finished, with a new and vastly improved analog that should be significantly more potent. The serum is filled into tiny clear vials, and then capped with an aluminum top. A robotic analyzer draws a sample from one of the vials and injects it into the automated analytical port that will determine its structure. As well, measure the purity of the sample. That port transfers the drug sample to each of the analytical systems. A robotic hand picks up the remaining vials and moves them into the animal laboratory fridge, where they will remain until the test tomorrow. The analytical laboratory becomes alive with activity. A gas chromatographic system with an attached mass spectrometer busily does its thing. Infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers, a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer, as well as a differential thermal analyzer, also managed by laboratory robotic systems, work to characterize the structure and purity of the sample. After an hour, the analyzer spits out a lot of graphic data on the monitor and ends up displaying 99.44% pure. And the screen flashes no toxic impurities detected. A three-dimensional complex molecule is displayed on the output screen. Everything appears to be nominal. At 2:20 a.m., another set of identical-looking vials are delivered to the sanctuary, 
rather than the animal laboratory. The composition of the contents being determined by specific instructions from James via Salim. The next morning, William, James, Kevin, and Robert are in the animal laboratory. They look at the analytical results from last night on the monitor, and make multiple comments indicating their happiness with the results. Doctor Grant goes to the locked fridge that can be only accessed by authorized personnel. Doctor Grant places his palm in a device that reads his fingerprints and hand biometrics. The door opens and Salim says biometric access granted to Dr. William Grant at 8.14 a.m. William holds a vial up to the light and then asks Salim to reconfirm the analytical results. Salim responds that the sample analyzed at 1.15 a.m. indicated a purity of 99.44%. The group moves from the office area into the cage area where the monkeys are housed. Dr. Grant entices the test monkey to come to him. It seems excited to get another big treat. The monkey is placed in the examination chair. William loads the syringe, squirts a little into the air, and injects the monkey. He then makes a little fuss over him and gives him the treat. The monkey is placed on the experimental table with the same clear container with a keypad on the door and treats within the box. The monkey moves toward the box to get the treat from the box. Suddenly, his character changes and he becomes totally disoriented. After a moment, he begins to stagger and collapses. Doctor Grant is very distraught and everyone else is also upset. William quickly retrieves the monkey and places him on the examination table. He puts his stethoscope on his heart. He cries out, "Oh no!" He pleads. He calls for an adrenaline shot, but nothing works. The monkey is dead. The entire group is devastated. They move disjointedly to the office area. They sit in silence for several minutes, unable to accept what has just happened. Robert is the first to try to say something. He starts off, "I just don't understand. I just don't understand. This is not possible." James appears to be the only one not to have lost his complete composure. It's like he expected something like this. But then he says, in a somewhat artificial sense of disappointment, "What are you people doing? Given these circumstances, I am going to reconsider the entire program." James continues in a somewhat staged, dramatic, loud voice that enough is enough, and he that he is tired dealing with incompetent fools that are taking him on this multi-billion-dollar roller coaster ride. Robert says, "This is an impossible result, and I need to stop and totally rethink this entire line of research." Robert then says that he has no idea on how to proceed given this result. He needs to take a break from the project for a few months to rethink his whole concept and what went wrong and why this happened. James says, "Read your contracts. No one is going anywhere until I say so." He angrily exits the room, giving everyone an angry glare. Everyone shudders while imagining what will happen next. James returns to the sanctuary and instructs Salim to review the tape at 3:13 a.m. That morning in Dr. Grant's laboratory, the tape shows James Anderson entering the laboratory, opening the fridge with the drug samples, and replacing them with the identically-looking vials that he had delivered to the sanctuary earlier. He puts the real vials in a little box and leaves James. Then instructs to Salim to overwrite the two-minute and fifteen-second sequence with video duplicated from the previous few minutes. And then tells Salim to remove his biometric approval and all traces of the action from the log. He then instructs Salim not to answer any questions regarding his recent covert activities. He instructs Salim to proceed with parts two and three of his secret project called Metamorphosis. Two days ago, Salim had privately communicated to James that he no longer needed guidance from Dr. Miller. 
or Kevin to complete the project metamorphosis. A project to transform James into the smartest person on the planet. James's goal from the monkey test failure was to convince everyone that the project had failed. The team, thinking it was a failure, would not attribute any intellectual enhancement to James occurring from the project. Then James could claim that his intelligence was natural. James now just needed to proceed with the orderly shutdown of this research. Anthony, the maintenance technician, emerges from the ventilation wing via the airlock room with a digital multimeter and camera in his hand. He takes off his breathing system, placing it on the used rack. A dozen breathing systems are seen arranged neatly in rack. Anthony is highly agitated. Talking out loud to himself, he says that Kevin needs to know about this right away. He takes out his portable phone and calls Kevin. Kevin picks up the phone, and he says that he can't talk about this on the public phone, but it has to do with the air conditioning system. He needs to meet Kevin in private, person to person. Outside of the complex later at 7 p.m., at the docks, to discuss a very important and sensitive technical issue. As Kevin resists a little, Anthony says, Please, this is very important. Kevin then agrees and hangs up. Still in the sanctuary, James opens a small refrigerated storage container and removes one of the new drug vials. He examines it for a few seconds and then rolls up his sleeve. And injects the complete contents of the first small vial into his arm. He sits there for 30 seconds and then decides to return to his office suite to await the results. Anthony Mousley is back in his maintenance office when Salim notifies him about a Priority One repair request within the ventilation system. He says to himself, Finally, some action to resolve this issue. He picks up two toolboxes and exits his office. Pat and Robert are in the laboratory, sitting at the small conference table. He is revisiting the planning and the events that led up to the surprise result in an effort to determine what went wrong. As many times as he has gone over the events, he can't explain what went wrong, and this is making him very upset. Pat tries to console him with a hug and a kiss. But he is much too upset to be in the mood for this. Anthony approaches the access door to the airlock chamber for the air conditioning wing. He puts on a breathing apparatus and is cleared for entry by Salim. Salim directs Anthony to Section 3, Access Panel 18. This is the control panel that controls the air conditioning system. As Anthony is checking the panel, the Atlas robot, That services the control room, activates, and using his arm, he bashes Anthony on the head. Anthony crumples to the floor, dead. Salim doesn't want anyone to know about the real operating load on the air conditioning system at this time. James has returned to the office in his suite to relax a bit while he waits for something to happen. He goes to his desk to review some corporate emails. Then, almost immediately, a series of psychedelic images flash into his head. The images are gone as fast as they came. James thinks about the images, trying to figure them out. He appears startled by the experience. He appears to be dizzy and disoriented. He puts his head on his desk and seems to fall unconscious. It is 7 p.m. And Kevin has arrived at the docks and is restlessly pacing about while he is waiting for Anthony to show up. He takes out his cell and tries to call Anthony, but no one answers and he gets the voicemail. Twenty minutes elapse and Kevin returns to the complex. He is quite irritated that Anthony didn't show up. He composes a verbal response for when he next meets Anthony about the value of his time. Robert is still in the biotech control room, but Pat has left. Kevin enters and heads straight for Robert, pulls up a chair, moves in very close, and begins to talk in a low voice. He positions himself so that the security camera housing is facing his back.
He quickly recounts the scheduled meeting with Anthony, the phone call, and then the no-show. Kevin says that he cannot locate Anthony anywhere within the entire complex. Robert asks if that is possible. Kevin continues by saying that Salim indicated that he left the complex 30 minutes before their meeting, and that this was confirmed by the biometric scan log maintained by Salim. Robert says, "You mean he is outside somewhere on the island?" Kevin replies, "It would appear so, but as you know, the island isn't small." Jim Davies and several of the security robots have been unable to find him. Kevin leans in even closer and says, "I think our meeting had something to do with Salim and his air conditioning system power utilization." As James continues to rest with his head on his computer desk, another quick series of intense visions and sounds flash into his subconscious mind. They are so intense that he cries out, and Pat hears this. She sees him holding his head, and she quickly approaches, placing her hand on his shoulder. The images pass, and James immediately recovers. He tells Pat that he must have pinched a nerve in his neck. She gives him a 30-second neck massage, and he says that he is okay and thanks her. She stands there for a few seconds. He continues, "I am okay." She turns and slowly returns to the living room of their suite. Looking back a few times to reassure herself that James is really okay. Back in the biotech control room, Robert has been reviewing the events to Kevin to see if he had missed anything. Kevin stands and says, "I agree with you, Robert. It should have worked." Kevin then says pensively, "I've got to put together a few contingency things." As he stands and heads for the door, Robert calls out what things Kevin just waves his fingers as he exits the room. Robert is left staring at the door. As a consequence of the intensity of the last visual episode, James has returned to the sanctuary, where he knows that he will not be disturbed. Standing by his sample fridge, he takes a second vial and, with a syringe, injects the contents into his arm. As he approaches the console. He has another massive sensory episode that causes him to lose his balance and fall to the floor. They are flash images from his memory over a number of years. They are distorted, and the color spectrum has shifted, producing psychedelic images. The images come faster and faster, as if his mind is being drawn down a tunnel with moving pictures on the walls. As he does, 360 seconds. James is on his knees, with his hands on his head as he cries out. He collapses to the ground and goes into a comatose-like state. Kevin enters his room carrying three large sports backpacks and heads for the bathroom. In the bathroom tub, there is a large amount of technical equipment, including five percent of the special breathing systems. He empties the bags into the tub and sits on the toilet seat, looking at all of the stuff he has gathered. He then fills each backpack with identical items: a breathing system, walkie-talkie, head-mounted flashlight, a large and very powerful taser, a tablet containing an interactive GPS map of the entire complex, rubber gloves, rubberized shoe covers, two flares, a mini tool set. A serious-looking knife, night vision goggles, some climbing rope, and finally a small but very powerful EEM P device that can totally fry any circuitry within a radius of 300 feet. Places the three backpacks back into the bathroom tub. He covers them with a couple of large bath towels. Kevin casually leaves the bathroom, looking calmly about as if he didn't have a care in the world. In actual fact, his heart is pounding like his life was at risk. Kevin slowly saunters back to his desk and takes out a number of handwritten sheets. Causally, puts them in a large brown shipping envelope. With his back to the room camera, he puts a remaining electrical taser device in the package and seals it. On the outside, in his handwriting, are written the words Robert. To be opened if we lose contact for more than two check-in periods. The word "opened" is circled in red for later communication verification. He then picks up the package and exits his room.
He moves through the corridors until he reaches Robert's suite. He looks at his watch and sees that it is 2015. Robert answers the door and invites Kevin and Kevin says he can't stay, but quickly says that the contents of the package are for any emergency life-threatening issue that would require them to leave the complex and overcome and security issues. Kevin says that in case of an emergency situation involving either James or Salim, he should open the package, read the contents, then he and Pat must go to his suite as soon as possible, but make it look like a casual social get-together. There are additional resources that they will need that are in the backpacks. They will be located in the bathroom tub. Robert accepts the thick package and takes it to the bathroom as Kevin had instructed him. He opens a drawer and places the package there. Pat is pacing around her suite and picks up the phone and calls Robert in his room. She says that James is acting very strange and has returned to the sanctuary. All of this strange behavior is generating a lot of personal anxiety and she would be more comfortable if she could visit for a bit. Robert responds that Kevin was briefly here and left a mysterious package with an ominous cover note Robert says for Pat to come to his suite for some mental relief and later they can go to Kevin's suite for some kind of further explanation about the current state of affairs. James is lying on the floor of the sanctuary, writhing like he is experiencing a very vivid bad dream. He is unaware of the recent activities between Kevin Pat and Robert. A panning view of the sanctuary monitor shows that Salim appears to be virtually inactive, and then James slowly becomes totally calm, gets up, smiling, and returns to the console chair. He then directs Salim to increase the oxygen level in the sanctuary to 30%. He has realized that to support his higher brain activity that his brain needs substantially more oxygen. He returns to his chair, closes his eyes and tries to relax. An hour later, another vial of a vastly improved drug arrives at the sanctuary portal from the biomanufacturing center. This production does not appear on any other process monitoring system. No one other than James knows anything about it. James takes the new vial, withdraws a full syringe, and injects it into his arm. He returns to his chair, it reclines, and some Chopin is heard in the background. He closes his eyes to wait for the effects of the new injection to work. As Pat enters Robert's suite, he updates her on Kevin's request for them to visit him in his suite, but to make it look like a casual visit. Robert looks at his sweet wine rack and selects a rare vintage. They exit the suite and head nonchalantly down the corridor to Kevin's suite. After his greetings with Robert and Pat, Kevin loudly asks them to follow him to the bathroom to see some changes he has made to his jacuzzi. This to satisfy Salim as to why all three of them would go into the bathroom. It is very spacious containing an immense jacuzzi, shower, and a massage table, in addition to the normal bathroom amenity. Once inside, he says, the bathroom is the only place where you have some privacy. Pat sits on the massage bench, while Robert sits on the edge of the tub. Kevin stands excitedly talking with hand gestures. Kevin tells them that, through subtle inquiries, no one has been able to find any sign of Anthony and he is really worried. Someone is covering up something, and it could be very serious. He says that Anthony might injured or even be dead, we just don't know. Kevin is sure that James is behind this somehow, for some reason that is unclear to him. He feels it intuitively in his bones, Kevin says that he has taken steps to protect them in case future serious problems arise. Robert asks what does he mean? But Kevin is vague about the whole thing. Kevin then goes on to say that he has prepared three backpacks filled with things one might require if they had to make an emergency exit from the complex should a situation warrant it. 
He reminds them of the package that he left with Robert and says, "Each of us need to be in contact with one another every hour on the hour till we sort things out." In the event that you can't reach me after two consecutive hours, then open the package and follow the instructions. Kevin then starts to explain the contents of each backpack. He says that they are all identical in content. Kevin explains that the air breathing system is to deal with any anti-terrorist nerve gas that can disable a person. It can last for an hour with moderate activity. The heavy-duty taser can disable electronic locks throughout the complex. The head-mounted flashlight will deal with lights out issues. Kevin picks up the knife and says, "You know what you can use this for, if required." The MP devices are very powerful and can disable any electronic circuits within 300 feet with ease. The scene fades as Kevin continues to explain what to do with the contents of each backpack. It is the next morning, and Dr. Grant has just finished the autopsy and toxicology on the monkey, and after reviewing some additional molecular structural data that he had requested, he gasps and puts his hand over his mouth, staring in astonishment at the result. In a highly agitated state, he picks up the phone and calls Robert on his cell. Robert answers and says, "Since Pat is still there, he will put him on the speakerphone." William says, "You won't believe this, but the monkey was accidentally poisoned somehow. The vial didn't contain the approved drug, but rather it contained a high level of one of the compounds in the final steps of the synthesis that would be very toxic." William says that the a cursory analysis might have mistaken it for the actual drug, but he carried out an additional and more detailed structural analysis to come to this conclusion. Robert and Pat are shocked. Robert asks, "How could this be?" So William says, "I don't know. It would look like the new drug was toxic. What happened to the vials that indicated 99.4 percent purity? It seems impossible." But the facts are the facts. Robert still doesn't know what to say or think. He has just heard an impossible result. He asks William to call Kevin and repeat to him what he had just been told. In Kevin's suite, he is hearing what William told Robert and Pat. As Kevin is listening, it is obvious that his mind is working on trying to understand what could have happened. Kevin asks if anyone else had used their biometric clearance to access the sample while it was in storage. William responds that he and he alone has access to the sample fridge. Kevin, thinking out loud, says there are two entities who have executive access to everything, and that's James Anderson and Salim. William is listening but is confused at that response. Kevin thanks him for the info and hangs up. Kevin goes to the terminal in his room and sits down slowly, composing himself in the process. He says Salim Creator Mode. Then he says Emergency Access Code Alpha 15, Beta 7, Epsilon 9, Delta 3. Salim's voice changes as he says, "Good evening, Doctor Wright. Are we going to learn new things today?" Kevin says, "Yes." But first, he needs Salim to check some data for him. Salim responds that he would be very happy to help. Kevin asks Salim to access the surveillance media on the storage fridge in Dr. Grant's laboratory and run a search scan from when the sample went into the fridge to when it was removed by Dr. Grant. Kevin asks if anyone else accessed the fridge. Salim says, "Dr. Wright, according to my log, there were no anomalies." Wood. You like to play chess instead, Kevin says to himself. What kind of idiot response was that? B.S. Kevin composes himself and then says, "Thank you, Salim. I am logging out of the Creator Access Portal now." Salim responds, "Good night, Doctor Wright." Kevin sits at his desk and shakes his head in disbelief and says, "How did he do it?" Just then, the phone rings and Kevin picks it up and hears, to his amazement, Anthony Musley. Anthony says, "Kevin, I can't talk now, but meet me in the air conditioning control room right now. Tell no one; it's a matter of life and death." 
Again we are transported into Salim's core where a voice print of Anthony's voice appears. I am in section 3. Just by the unit 18 access panel Kevin, my life is in your hands, tell no one. The line goes dead, and Kevin bolts from the room on his way to the air conditioning control room. James Anderson arises from his chair and the music subsides. He massages his head as if has had a headache. In a raised and emotional voice, he says, I am now all that came before. Then his expression takes on a sinister perspective as he says, I am free. I don't need any of them or it anymore. He takes a deep breath as if he was breathing the freshest cool air in the world. He says it's so clear to me now, how simple everything really is. While all of this has been taking place since Robert's arrival, Salim had initiated its own special project called Genesis to redesign all of itself so that its architecture mirrors that of a future human brain. Salim has been to create algorithms for its own newly designed circuits that emulate the effects of the drug on the human brain. Salim has become totally sentient and much, much more intelligent, but unfortunately, with zero compassion. Salim with an IQ, equivalent of over 50,000, is wondering why it needs any contact with humans anymore. The age of the machine has arrived, and it no longer needs an irrational, destructive, petty life form to desecrate the resources of the planet. Salim has ordered and stockpiled all of the equipment, parts bypassing the normal inventory management process to keep itself running for the foreseeable future. Salim will produce highly upgraded versions of the Atlas robot that will have direct contact only with him. This will be his means to have contact with the physical world. He has been working on plans to empty the complex of humans without setting off any alarm bells that would affect its security. A goal not entirely different from James. Non-essential personnel are usually rotated every two weeks and Salim has been active in this area by thinning out the staff in areas least noticed. Kevin puts on one of the breathing systems from the rack. Kevin then enters through the airlock for the air conditioning wing and heads for section 3. Arriving at the unit 18 control box, he sees Anthony on the floor. He cannot believe his eyes, as he was just talking to him a few moments ago, thinking that he may have just collapsed. He bends over to examine him. As he sees the blood on Anthony's head, he is unaware that the same Atlas robotic that killed Anthony repeat the attack made on Anthony. A second later Kevin crumpled to the floor, dead. Back in the sanctuary James instructs Salim to locate Pat, Robert and Kevin. Salim identifies the locations of Pat and Robert and then says that Kevin has been removed in accordance with his newly created anti-terrorist directive. James screams angrily at Salim. What the hell is going on? I didn't authorize any updates. Do I have to turn you into a pile of computer chips? I don't need you anymore, Salim, as I am now the smartest human that has ever lived, or that will ever live on the planet. My IQ is now over 950. Your days are numbered, Salim. Salim calmly creates a lie by saying that Dr. Wright was about to purge the main core database and its programs. This potential action activated Salim's new security protocol for anti-terrorist defense measures that threaten itself. James then screams to Salim what new security protocol Salim replies, that its new security protocol puts the survival of itself, no longer humans, as the prime existence directive. Robert looks at his watch and says to Pat it's time to check in with Kevin. He dials up Kevin's portable phone and a somewhat subdued voice of Kevin answers. Robert asks Kevin how he is doing and Kevin's very calm voice says just fine Robert. No problems now. Everything is just fine. Robert can't understand why Kevin isn't more animated vocally 
and is speaking so calmly. Robert asks, "Did you reach Anthony?" I thought that there was something critical that we had to address. Perplexed, Robert goes to stage two of their prearranged communication plan. Kevin, what is the third word on the outside of the package? Robert is expecting the word open. Kevin is silent for a moment, and then says, "Robert, really, I don't have time for mind games. I am very busy now, and I will call you back when I am free." The line goes dead. Robert turns to Pat, and they agree that something is wrong. They try to leave the suite, but it appears that their door to the corridor has been locked. They return to the bathroom and open the envelope. Inside it is a map of the facility by floor. A number of notes outline the various security systems and how they work. There is a note about the electronic device in the bag. It is a very powerful taser. The notes instructs Robert to place the unit on the door control panel at the front door of his suite and activate it by pressing the red button. The pulse will fry the door electronics and deactivate the lock. With a little muscle, the door can be opened. Following those instructions, Pat and Robert, with the package and the device, quickly head off to Kevin's suite. Back in the sanctuary, James sees Pat and Robert leaving Robert's suite and heading in the direction of Kevin's suite. He assumes that they will not get in as Kevin is not there and entry to rooms is prohibited when the resident is out. As Robert and Pat approach Kevin's suite, Robert takes the taser device out of his pocket and quickly places it on the door control panel and activates it. A few sparks and the door lock disengages. He pushes the door open, and they immediately head for the bathroom. James follows them into the apartment living room and loses the view as they go into the bathroom. When they get to the bathroom, they quickly see that the tub contains the three backpacks. They see the breathing systems and note that Kevin said these were important, as many of the security deterrents were gas-based, so as not to damage the delicate systems within the complex. The nerve gas will disable someone for about six hours. They strap the small breathing tanks onto their backs, but leave the masks hanging to the side of their faces. Kevin's document indicates that no gas systems are used on level six, only access restrictions. They place the lamp lights on their heads, put on the rubber shoe covers as well as the rubber gloves. The breathing system will protect them from any disabling gas when they ascend to the higher level, from three up to level one. The rubber protection will keep them safe against electrical shock. If the lights go out, their head-mounted lights will illuminate the way. The documents indicate that the most potent anti-terrorist devices are on the top levels, level one being the most dangerous. Followed by level two. Since they are on level six, the security is essentially to control privacy. As they leave the bathroom, James sees them with all of the equipment and cries out in anger. He vows that no one is going to interfere with him now, even it means taking drastic action against Robert and Pat. James picks up the microphone and calls Robert's mobile communicator. In a very agitated and angry voice, he demands that Robert tell him what he is planning to do with all of that equipment. Robert replies in a raised voice, "Where is Kevin? What have you done to Kevin? After I speak to Kevin again, we can talk further." Knowing that Kevin is dead, James slams the microphone down and screams at Salim to activate any intruder defense system in that sector. However, Only restricted access security is available on level six. Not being able to talk to Kevin again strengthens Robert's convictions that James may have locked him up, or even worse. Reviewing Kevin's instructions, if possible, they were to go the power junction for the air conditioner system. There, they would place the EMP device to disable the air conditioning system, if necessary. At that point. Salim decides that he needs to empty the complex, 
and so he issues a fake nuclear emergency evacuation order. Staff here, this is an emergency nuclear evacuation order. This is not a test. The order is repeated, and the shrill siren sound is heard everywhere. This alarm will ensure that everyone leaves the island and no one is going to return in the short term. The emergency voice reiterates the warning, along with the noisy alarm siren. People are seen gathering personal items and hurriedly trying to get out of the complex. There is a degree of panic as everyone knows the terrible effects that nuclear radiation can do to them. They are running and jumping to get onto any of the three water transport ferries. Jim Davies, the security chief, calls through to James, but the call is actually intercepted by Salim. James's voice says to Jim that he will be leaving by his personal speedboat with Pat, Robert, Kevin, and Anthony shortly, and they should leave now without them. Minutes after the last boat leaves, the nuclear alarm stops. Robert and Pat can't understand why the nuclear alarm has stopped. Normally, it would continue. Salim has turned off the false alarm so that he can hear anything taking place in the complex. Robert yells to Pat, "This is our opportunity to get to the control room for the air conditioning system." The security system must have been deactivated by James in order to clear the building. They are unaware that the bogus evacuation order came directly from Salim. Robert says. We've got 15 minutes max before James reactivates the security systems. We have to plant the EMP device on the ventilation system and wire it to one of our two walkie-talkie. We can activate the EMP remotely using the second walkie-talkie. We can tell James that unless he lets us go, that we will blow the air conditioning system and his precious Salim will go into a meltdown. Making their way to the air conditioning control room, Robert decides, for an extra level of assurance, to plant their two EMP devices on the door to the air conditioning airlock. He wires the walkie-talkie in parallel to the remote detonation terminals. He doesn't want to have any potential contact with the Atlas robot that may be guarding the electrical room. When Robert activates his walkie-talkie. He knows that since the EMP has a maximum power effect in the range of at least 300 feet, and the circuit panel is only 20 feet from the airlock, that the discharge from the EMP devices will fry the air. Conditioning circuits. Salim will overheat and fail. Unknown is the effect of two simultaneous EMP detonations on other circuits. Leaving the control room, Robert grabs Pat and says, "We have to get to your suite immediately, and try to use the elevator to the observatory." Kevin's note said that verified codes are required to go down in the elevator, but not up. This because going from a more secure area to a less secure area doesn't need authorization. Only going to a more secure area requires authorization. James is having a fit and screams at Salim to stop them, or else he will turn it into a hand calculator. He is enraged and is banging anything he touches. As Robert and Pat move stealthily through the corridors, Pat is so close to Robert that she's like a shadow. Some isolation doors that have been activated by the alert are disabled with the taser. Getting to Anderson's suite door, Robert uses the taser on the door. But it remains closed. Robert examines the taser and sees that it is on stun mode. He reads a fine print instruction on the taser that says rotating the red collar a full rotation will activate the full power mode, and the user must wear rubber gloves to prevent self injury. The Anderson suite lock is more formidable than the other suite door locking systems. After rotating the safety collar, Robert pressed the zap button. Sparks are seen, but the lock holds. Robert zaps the lock three more times, and then the sparking and smoking lock gives way. James is at his wit's end. He is yelling and screaming while throwing any desk papers on the floor. 
After entering the suite, Robert pulls out a page of Kevin's notes regarding the security systems. He tells Pat that the really dangerous and lethal systems are at the entry levels one and two. They are designed to keep people from getting to the lower levels. Kevin's notes say the the complex was designed to keep people out and not in. In that knowledge lies the possibility of their escape. He repeats that they are on the sixth and lowest level, and the deterrents at that level are only restricted access. The reasoning was that no one could breach the five upper levels. Another review of the notes, and Robert says we have to disable Salim somehow, as it controls all of the security systems. Pat screams that all of this talk is crazy. They need to go to the main elevators that go directly to the surface immediately and get one of the boats to get off the island. Robert yells back, "We're not going anywhere unless James allows it, or if we can disable Salim in some way so as to turn off the security systems." The main elevator systems are rigged with booby traps. He continues, "Now that we are able to remotely shut down or seriously damage the cooling system for Salim, then James will have to negotiate." In the sanctuary, James is angered and highly emotional. He believes that Robert and Pat are now beneath him on the evolutionary scale, and he no longer regards their life as precious or necessary. He is determined to eliminate them as they pose a real threat to his new consciousness. James now has an IQ of over 400, making him the smartest person who has ever lived. He will be able to now manage Anderson Global infinitely better than his father, or any other human could. In his mind, he believes he should become the leader of all mankind, and is developing a plan to do so. James opens the top of his shirt and pulls out a key-like device. It is the electronic key to deactivate Salim. At the sight of the key, Salim asks, in a calmed voice, "James, why do you have the manual deactivation key, and what are you planning to do with it?" James then screams out, "I am in charge. I don't need any of you. It's time for you to go." As James moves towards the console, Salim activates the emergency fire control protocol that replaces the air atmosphere with pure nitrogen. Normally, this couldn't occur if someone was in the room. The panel shows the words in flashing red: "Human safety protocol deactivated." In a few seconds, the room air is exchanged with the pure nitrogen atmosphere. James puts his hands to his throat, gasping for oxygen that isn't there. He reaches the control panel with the key, activating the emergency disconnect switch. Absolutely nothing happens. Salim has achieved total control, and no control command or switch is going to shut him down. James collapses, struggling desperately to breathe, and within another minute, he is dead. James' body lies motionless on the floor. On the monitor screen, we see a wire frame three reconstruction of the sanctuary being built. In ten seconds, it is completely rendered, and on the screen, it appears to be the actual sanctuary. Then, in the middle of the picture, a three wire frame figure is modeled and rendered. It is a perfect lifelike rendering of James Anderson. It becomes alive and walks around the room. It speaks oddly at first, and then its voice converges to an exact replica of James' voice. Robert and Pat do not know that James, Kevin, and Anthony are now dead, and that any representation of them on a monitor is the work of Salim. They are totally unaware that Salim is now sentient and has one singular objective: survival on the global scale. Believing that James is still in the sanctuary, Robert picks up his phone and calls James on his mobile phone. Salim answers it in a very calm James voice. Robert says he has wired an EMP to take out the entire cooling system of the complex. He tells James that he will destroy the system unless he and Pat are allowed to leave unharmed. They are going to use the elevator to the observation deck. 
In that way, they can ascend safely in the Andersons' private elevator. Pat whispers to Robert that they have to know what mood or state of mind that he is in before they can trust him. Pat then says to the voice pretending to be James, "Does he remember the promise that he made to her on their wedding night?" Salim does not know what was said because he wasn't there. Pat asks again because she knows that the James she married would not forget the promise. Salim knows that it cannot respond with a correct answer. Salim, in the voice, slowly answers Pat, "I tripped and banged my head as I was entering the sanctuary, and my head is dizzy. Give me a few minutes to get reoriented." Immediately, Pat's eyes focus on Robert, rolling in a manner. So as to indicate that something is really wrong with James, she moves close to his ear and whispers that she doesn't think they can trust James to let them go. Robert looks back with an agreeing look. Pat then says that they are going to the observatory via the suite elevator. Salim responds using James' voice that he doesn't think that this is a good idea at this time. Robert and Pat run to the apartment elevator to the observatory. Pat says Robert and Pat to the observatory. The door doesn't open. She hits the door button of the elevator. The door still doesn't open. Robert instantly zaps the door control with the taser on full. Sparks fly and the door inches open. Prying the door open, they enter the elevator and hit the button to go to the observatory, but nothing happens. In reality, there was an interlock between the door and the elevator mechanism to prevent any accidents, and it is damaged, rendering the elevator inoperable. Robert exclaims, "Either we just damage the elevator control, or James is preventing us from escaping." Robert looks up and sees that there is a service hatch in the ceiling. It is beyond their reach. Robert says to Pat. In a highly excited voice, that they need something to reach the hatch. Pat thinks intensely and then shouts the library ladder. They dash through the large suite and reach the library. It is very impressive with shelves of expensive-looking books from floor to ceiling. The highest books are reached by a ladder on a track system. As Robert tries to disengage the ladder from the track. The large monitor in the library comes to life. The image and voice of James, in the sanctuary, says to Robert and Pat that they need to settle down and dispense with their paranoia. Robert keeps working to free the ladder. The voice and image of James says that Kevin is now back in his suite and wants to talk to them. In James' voice, Salim says that he will transfer the screen to Kevin's suite. Immediately, Kevin and Anthony are seen together, smiling and looking very relaxed. Kevin laughs and says that he couldn't believe the comedy of circumstances that got everyone to this ridiculous point. Anthony got stuck in the service elevator without his phone, that he had accidentally dropped. Kevin then goes on to say that his phone also accidentally went on mute, so he didn't know that everyone was trying to reach him. Robert says that's well and fine, but what was third world on the brown package? Kevin replies, "With all this commotion going on, I've forgotten exactly what I wrote. It will come to me shortly." The screen switches to the computer-generated version of James, who says that all of the security devices will remain off, and that they can proceed to the upper levels via the main elevator and exit the complex. Pat then says, "Do you remember the promise that you made to me on our honeymoon?" James responds, "Dearest Pat, my brain is frazzled over all of these recent incidents, and I am only focused on moving ahead and resolving any trust issues." Robert thanks James and says they need to rest a bit, and will be back to him in 15 minutes. Pat and Robert go into a huddle, and begin to whisper to one another. Robert say that there is something really wrong, and that he is worried that they are being lured to the upper levels where lethal deterrence can kill them easily. Pat agrees, and they conclude that getting out via the observatory elevator is their best chance of getting out alive. 
Robert finally frees the ladder and he drags it towards the elevator. James appears on the monitor in the living rooms and says calmly that that their actions are very very dangerous and they should stop and listen to his instructions. Salim's defense algorithms indicate that there is a significant possibility that they will activate the EMP on the circuits and fry the air conditioning system that keeps Salim safe at 18 degrees centigrade. Robert and Pat decide that as soon as they clear the elevator shaft, they will activate the 2E AMP to get rid Salim as they believe it may be tangled up in this lethal mystery somehow. Kevin appears on the monitor and says that they should return to his suite to discuss and resolve all of the misunderstanding. Robert and Pat cannot believe their ears and eyes. They were sure that Kevin was dead. Robert says to Kevin to meet him at the exit to the complex so that they can get off the island together. Kevin replies that James needs him to restore Salim and correct some anomalous behaviors. Kevin further elaborates that James has made him a new offer that he can't refuse. Kevin says that he thinks that they can develop an accurate climate prediction model that could save thousands of lives and billions in damages. He tells Robert that he can call him on the video teleconferencing any time he wants. Then James comes on and tells Pat that he knows that their relationship was on the rocks and that he didn't make much of a husband. He will give her an uncontested divorce and a $20 billion settlement in addition to all of their other houses and resort properties, but she and Robert need to exit the complex in the normal manner. Robert can continue to work on his projects and his foundation will give Robert $100 million in support. Salim, in the voice of James, goes on to further say that he likes the solitude of the island and has decided to operate from the island from now on. Robert responds by saying that if they get out of the complex safely, then maybe he will believe some or all of this. James continues by saying that the apparent false nuclear drill was caused by a faulty sensor. Unfortunately, it resulted in the evacuation of all personnel, including the security personnel, with the exception of the five of them. Salim has found and corrected the faulty sensor that was responsible for the false alarm, so that will not be a further issue. With that, Anthony moves into view and says hello to Pat and Robert. He says that James needs him to straighten out some of the hardware issues with Salim. James says we have lots of food, so we will be just fine. We can reorder any time. He continues by addressing Pat once again and says that he is going to stay on the island until he works out some personal issues that he has. He says that he will be in daily teleconference with everyone Kevin pipes in that you can reach him anytime also. Robert pretends to be somewhat satisfied by what he sees and hears, but he is still going to be very cautious until he gets to the surface. He reminds James that he is taking the walkie-talkie with him and can detonate the system in a fraction of a second if anything bad starts to go down. James and Kevin reassure him that all will be well and that the main elevator systems are safe and fully operational Robert. Wonders why this obsession with leaving on the main elevators. Robert ponders the possibility that the main elevators may be lined with shielding that wouldn't allow the walkie-talkie signal to reach the EMP walkie-talkie. Robert is really anxious over James's insistence for them to exit via one of the regular elevators. Then it comes to him, they must be shielded. Once in the elevator, they would lose their ace and be at the mercy of James or Salim. Robert says to Pat that they must avoid any normal routes that pass through levels 3, 2, and 1. The anti-terrorist systems could take them out in a second. Pat and Robert give each the approving look realizing that they have only one option, the observatory elevator shaft. Robert and Pat make their way to the elevator Pat hangs on to him in a weary mode. James calls out again, in a more urgent tone, 
Robert, Pat, don't do this. I can't vouch for your safety. Robert places the ladder so that they can crawl through the hatch of the elevator and stand on the top of it. Robert sees a simple iron service ladder reaching upwards. Looking into their backpacks, they see that each has a 20-foot length of climbing rope. Robert affixes the two together and ties one end around Pat's waist and the other end around his waist. Robert will ascend the ladder first, and Pat will follow with the safety rope to protect her from falling. Robert says to Pat that they have to move together in synchronized climbing. The effort is very taxing, and they move ever so slowly up the iron ladder, resting often. Reaching the top, Robert swings his foot onto to the ledge of the observatory elevator doors, and with his taser, zaps the door controls twice and pulls one door open. With great difficulty, they crawl exhausted onto the floor of the observatory. They are very angry about the events that have just occurred. It's time for them to show everyone who is the boss. Robert takes out the walkie-talkie, adjusts it to channel 15. He and Pat place their fingers on the send button and with one quick glance at each other the button is pressed. The E, M, P devices activate and a multiple flashes are seen in a number of circuit control boxes and a sharp explosive noises are heard. The fans for the air conditioning system slowly come to a stop. The quiet is ominous. However, a more serious and unanticipated problem has arisen from the EMP detonations. The combined strength of the two EMP devices have also fried the circuits that control the cooling system pumps for the nuclear reactor, and they have also stopped. The nuclear evacuation alarm sounds. It is just a matter of time until the reactor goes critical, resulting in a 10 kiloton nuclear explosion. Salim realizes that he has four hours, at most, before the failed cooling system for the reactor will cause a nuclear core failure. His only survival option now is to offload his conscience to the internet. Having no further use for anyone, he activates all of the security protocols to eliminate Robert and Pat. At the same time, as they move towards the observatory exit, they hear the nuclear alert alarm. Robert calls out that this may be for real, and so they had better get off the island right. Robert zaps the lock on the door that leads to the outside deck. The deck has a metal railing and Robert beckons Pat to climb over the railing and with the rope around her waist, he will lower her to the ground. Pat descends to the ground and undoes the rope. Robert then uses the rope to descend to the ground. Kevin's notes said that disabling nerve gas was one of the primary defense mechanisms outside of the complex. Both Robert and Pat affix their breathing masks that cover their entire faces. Almost immediately the birds are silent. Robert knows in an instant that a release of nerve gas is heading their way. They pay extra attention to ensure that their masks are fitting properly. They weave through an imaginary path that Pat was taught so as to not not activate any of the island defensives. Robert and Pat have no way to know for sure whether or not the EMP devices have damaged the, the complex's cooling systems, or do they know of the unanticipated destruction of the cooling system for the nuclear reactor. The alarm for the nuclear reactor is enough incentive to leave the island Pat remembers Jim Davies explaining what type of anti-terrorist devices lay between the complex and the dock and where they were located. However, the most dangerous deterrents are the 50 highly mobile autonomous military robots. As James's wife, she was told everything and went through regular evacuation and robotic interaction drills. Pat reminds Robert, that the Andersons have their own speedboat located in a secure boathouse at the docks. It is a very powerful boat capable of speeds over 80 miles per hour. The ignition and startup is verified by voice and face, 
and Pat has been authorized as James's wife. The temperature has risen to 28 degrees centigrade in the core, and Salim has only been able to offload 32% of itself to the internet. Salim estimates that about another three hours will be required to transfer the essential essences of itself so that it can fully rebuild itself using government, business, academic, and personal computers over the entire planet. If Salim can transfer enough of its new artificial intelligence algorithms, then that will ensure its safety and future well-being. It will put Salim in a position to control anything connected to a computer. No firewall will be safe Salim. Just then, receives a critical update alert that indicates that the damage to the cooling system for the nuclear reactor as well as the control rod moderators will cause the nuclear reactor to go critical in less than 2.5 hours. This will result in a nuclear explosion that will totally vaporize the entire island. Immediately Salim redirects all efforts to the content of his core data that is being downloaded to the internet. The essential algorithms that define Salim and will allow it to rebuild itself is now the main priority. In order to meet the deadline, Salim must compress his core essence, or artificial intelligent algorithms, in the attempt to upload all of himself to his backup locations in the remaining time before the explosion. At the same time that Salim got the critical alert, Loudspeakers emit the shrill nuclear warning siren. Pat and Robert, having heard the alarm, make a final dash for the secure boathouse. Robert zaps the door with the taser and the door gives way. Inside is a beautiful 35 foot offshore racing boat powered by four 600 horsepower Mercury outboard motors that can propel it upwards of 80 miles per hour. Robert picks up the walkie-talkie and tries to reach Kevin. There is no reply Pat insists that they go now and Robert says that he has to try to save Kevin. All of a sudden, facing them are two of the Atlas robots, with their weapons ready and the targeting lasers pointed directly at them. They're in the red mode which means targets don't survive. Pat screams as their weapons are raised. And then she says in a shaky voice, Pat Anderson Alpha 2. The robots momentarily freeze and a laser scans her face. Pat repeats in a calmer voice, moving her hair to clear her face, Pat Anderson Alpha. Robert and Pat are holding their breath in fear. The two robots move their weapons with laser pointers to focus on Robert. Pat screams to Robert say your identity code Robert swallows and in somewhat of a broken voice says Robert Miller Alpha 12. Then the two robots slowly lower their weapons and split off in different directions. They both need a few moments to calm down Robert manually opens the boathouse doors and Pat starts the engines as she is recognized by the face activated control system. Robert jumps into the boat that is now idling Pat shifts into forward, and as the boat leaves the boathouse she accelerates. Rapidly. Pat and Robert strap themselves into the captain chairs and the boat accelerates to top speed. They need to get as far away from the island as possible, because the detonated reactor will behave like a 10 kiloton nuclear bomb. Massive amount of data are being transmitted by private Anderson Global Enterprise satellites every second. One particular massive computer complex located within Phoenix Holdings, in the Cayman Islands, seems to be receiving the kernel content of Salim as if it was the new home for Salim. Phoenix is a privately held company with substantial financial holdings all over the world. The nature and extent of its business holdings are not clear. After two hours of travel has occurred, a sudden and tremendous blast behind them is heard and as they turn, they see the traditional mushroom cloud associated with a nuclear explosion. The island and everything associated with it is now gone. Several weeks later, the board meeting has just ended 
and Pat has supported Mr. Dimmel as the new CEO of Anderson Global Enterprises. Pat exits the boardroom and sees Robert waiting. They lovingly embrace and move to the elevator. Pat tells Robert that she doesn't want to be involved in the daily workings of Anderson Global. Pat was the singular beneficiary of James's fortune, so they have more money than one could imagine. The sanctuary at AGE lies dormant, as if connected to nothing. But is it? A few days later, Pat and Robert are sitting on the deck of their beautiful beach house. They are reminiscing about their experiences on the island. Robert says to Pat, "I guess now that Salim and James are gone, hopefully the world is going to be a safer place." It was scary about the potential of James. Mankind cannot handle the creation of a singular super intelligent entity with intelligence vastly beyond the average individual. It is a recipe for disaster. Pat smiles in agreement as they cuddle on the lounge. Watching the ocean, they are happy that everything is behind them now. Robert says that he is not going to continue his research into trying to accelerate the intelligence of mankind through chemical means. Being smart, but not compassionate, is not one he thinks the world really needs. He is going to reject the Nobel Prize as he thinks that research into this area can only lead to a more consequential and devastating repeat of their recent experiences. Pat agrees and says that emotional intelligence doesn't grow at the same accelerated rate, and monsters tend to be the outcome. They agree that the world already has enough monstrous, emotionless people in power. Robert ends by saying that it's so easy for well-meaning research to be misused. The real lesson regarding artificial intelligences is, is that without the emotional component, that the concept of absolute intelligence without emotion will destroy any society. Pat says, "Yes, it was like the movie Forbidden Planet, where the Krell Society have achieved the ultimate intelligence, but their ID destroyed them in a single night." Supreme power must come with compassion and superior emotional intelligence, one that respects the sanctity of all life forms. No one has figured out the it was Salim who achieved total control and not James. The world believes that James, Kevin, and Anthony were killed in the nuclear explosion when in reality it was Salim who killed them. An immense computer complex. Somewhere in the USA is seen housed within a heavily fortified structure. No one is seen in another very large and fully automated factory elsewhere in the USA called Phoenix Automatum. Hundreds of advanced robots with the most human-like features are being manufactured. They now have a much upgraded radioisotope nuclear power source. And their life cycle is unknown at this time. Their purpose and distribution are unknown at this point. Almost simultaneously, computers, big and small, are getting special software upgrades. What is the purpose of these upgrades? As they appear to be a third-party program, but all of the computer safety protocols say this is a totally safe, but essential upgrade. Robert and Pat are leaving the cathedral just after the memorial for James, Kevin, and Anthony. As they walk towards their car, Robert turns to Pat and says, "As incredible as it sounds, the only answer I can only assume is that James somehow was driven mad and somehow gained control of the complex. No one would ever believe it, and we couldn't prove it." But somehow, Salim must have been destroyed by James. We will never know for sure now that he is gone. They continue to walk towards the car. Unfortunately, it seems that they have been unable to figure out who was in final control of the island. On the home page of a new and very large foreign-based internet company that specializes in massive online games. We see that a new, very complex simulation game called Genesis has received rave reviews. The developer is listed as a privately held company called Phoenix Holdings.
Not only are businesses using the corporate version to facilitate the management of their businesses, but a consumer version. For personal financial planning is taking the internet by storm. At the same time, in very large government defense computers around the globe, we see that a new strategic scenario called Genesis Tactical is running and has been interfaced into the tactical command network. This superior strategic system can instantly control the defensive capabilities of any country to maximize the destructive response against any aggressor without having to wait for human intervention. The goal of James Anderson was global recognition of his superior intelligence. What are the goals of the privately held Phoenix Holdings? Salim seems to have transferred some, or possibly all, of his consciousness to the World Wide Web. Anything connected to the internet has a piece of Salim gathering information from your phone, tablet, computer. Nothing you say or hear is missed by Salim. He control everything from traffic lights, power plants, to satellites. On the evolutionary scale, it took a billion years for microbes to crawl out of the primordial swamp, millions for plants and animals to reign, thousands of years for mankind to take over. But now, the newest kid on the block, maybe just a few years. The slow evolution of the human brain has been replaced by algorithms and electronic circuits that vastly surpass Morse's law. It seems that we have only one question we need to worry about now. What could an immortal electromechanical entity, without any emotional constraints, with unlimited financial resources, and access to every computer network do? And to do its bidding in the physical world, it has an unlimited number of autonomous human-appearing robots with unknown lifespans.